It's nice to be here. It's a lovely library you have here, too. I mean, we see libraries all over the country, and this is a magnificent facility that you have. And it's great to be part of this, uh, of this series. Yeah, it is. You should give yourself a round of applause. We were just in the Carnegie. Yeah, you were. We were just in the Carnegie Library up in Pittsburgh. Did a History Matters event up there. This building very much reminds me of the Carnegie Library up there. It's very similar in the way it's laid out and the structure of it. I want to talk to you a little bit about the Patriot Threat. And then I like questions, so I don't speak very long. I really want to talk about what you want to talk about. So we'll, you know, don't be bashful, fire away when the time comes. But first, I'll just tell you a little bit about this book. Let's go back to 1911. 1911, the Republicans are, have control of the Congress, and they also have control of the White House, but things are shifting. The 1912 presidential election is coming. The country is shifting over to a more progressive liberalism. Uh, the time of Woodrow Wilson is approaching and coming. The Republicans have a label that has been attached to them that they don't really care for, the party of the rich. Now, we use that label sometimes today to refer to the Republican Party, but it didn't start today. It started back then in the early part of the 20th century. So they came up with an idea to dispel this thing of the party of the rich. They decided to propose an amendment to the Constitution, the 16th Amendment, which would essentially make it easier to implement an income tax on themselves. So they said, we're going to tax ourselves with an income tax. We're not the party of the rich. So they proposed this amendment. Now, they did not want it to pass. That was not the idea. The idea was to just throw it out there, let it be voted down, and go away, and then they would get the brownie points for doing that. Well, to their great chagrin, the Congress approved it, and they sent it to the states. Now, when they sent it to the states, the Republicans said, no, nah, it'll never happen. I mean, people, I mean, it just didn't apply to rich people either, by the way. The ta income tax was to all across, for, it would apply to all. It had certain income limits, but it would, you know, would they tax themselves? Would people, people actually make an amendment to the Constitution to tax themselves? Nobody would ever do that. Well, sure enough, no, no, it didn't work out. One state after another was ratifying it, one after the other. Finally, in February of 1913, they were getting down to the 36th state. That's all you needed then to get ratification. And the Solicitor General of the United States writes a memorandum to the Secretary of State of the United States. Now, the reason why we know this is because the memo has survived. You can actually read it. It's in the novel, and it's also you can read it online. And he warns the Secretary of State that there's a problem in the ratification process. There's some things that aren't going right. There's some things that are happening in the state level that you need to be aware of. Please do not move forward with this amendment until we clear all of this up. Well, the Secretary of State promptly ignored that memorandum and a few days later declared the amendment in effect. Now, he did not declare it ratified. He said, in effect. The amendment took effect and went in. About 20 years ago, a gentleman decided to go around to every state capital in every state that considered the 16th Amendment to find out what the Solicitor General was talking about. What was wrong? What was he warning about? The memo doesn't speak of that. It just warns in general terms. What he found was surprising. In nearly every state, there was a problem. In 15 of the states, the problems were so severe that the states most likely never even ratified the amendment. You only need to void six to void the amendment, so you can see why the Solicitor General was very concerned. Here's an example. In Ten in, well, I shouldn't say in Tennessee. We are in Tennessee. I, mean, I am here because I, I use Tennessee as the example all the time, and I just realize I'm here in this state which has a long history of despising taxes. Your constitution even forbids the implementation of any new taxes without certain procedures that have to be put in place. And that, has got, that went all the way back to the early part of the 20th century, by the way. That provision was ignored. Your House of Representatives ratified the 16th Amendment. Your Senate rejected the 16th Amendment. 
Somehow it got to the governor's desk, and the governor at the time vetoed the amendment, but Tennessee is in the yes column. There's an example right there of something that's very graphic that happened. It's fascinating, really, and there are more like that. Some, some are in the book, some I didn't. The gentleman wrote an, a book for his research. He thinks very highly of his book, though, by the way. It's extremely expensive. Uh, but I stumbled onto his research one day by accident. I was doing research for the Lincoln myth, and I just stumbled onto this. And I bought his book, and I looked at his research, and he was very meticulous. He annotated everything. You could literally take what he did in Tennessee, go over to the state archives, and go behind him and find all of those documents because he annotated everything very clearly. Uh, you can see there can be some serious trouble here. I read around 40 federal court opinions where some people have tried to make this argument in court to try to avoid paying taxes. The federal judges do not even want to hear it. They will not even allow this argument to be raised. I can understand why, because there's some serious implications to it if you get into the meat of it a little bit. Remember, we get 90% of our revenues in this country from income tax. If there's something wrong with that, we're in deep trouble because our debt accrues at the rate of $1 million every 60 seconds. It's a serious problem, so we can't, the courts won't even discuss this issue. They don't even want to talk about anything fundamentally wrong. And I'm not saying this is not, this is not a manifesto to not pay your taxes. You have to pay your taxes. The IRS hopefully has a good sense of humor here. They understand that this is a novel and it's not real by definition. But it is something fascinating that happened 100 years ago that was swept under the rug. It was literally swept under the rug. And you could get away with that back then because you didn't have cable news and you didn't have all kinds of things that could go behind it. And it was only discovered 20 years ago when this gentleman went around and took a look at it. And I thought it would make a wonderful novel. And it did turn out to be a, a good thriller that Cotton Malone gets caught up in. Those of you who have read my books know that Cotton Malone's a retired Justice Department agent. He lives in Copenhagen. He runs an old bookshop. Stays in trouble all the time. Like his creator. Very similar. We stay in trouble all the time. This is his 10th adventure. Don't be put off by that. If you've not read any, I don't read, write them where you have to read them in order. There's not required. You can read them backwards. You can read in the middle. You can skip around. If you read them in order, you might recognize a few things. But if you don't, you will not be irritated that you missed anything because I hate that in a series. So I like the books to kind of stand by themselves. He gets caught up in an adventure that I finally was able to do within 24 hours. The whole thing takes place in 23 hours. Most of my novels are three to four days, two, or two to four days. But I finally did one here in 23 hours. So there's a lot happening fast. Malone's in Venice, then he's in Croatia, and Stephanie Nell's in Washington, D.C., and they play this out. The feud between Andrew Mellon and Franklin Roosevelt factors into this book very much so. These two gentlemen hated each other. Mellon was the most powerful and richest man in America in the 1920s. He was Secretary of Treasury for 11 years under three different presidents, which is a feat all by itself to accomplish. No one quite knows how he accomplished that. I have a theory about it that I do deal with in the novel. But Mellon and Roosevelt hated each other. Roosevelt hated him so bad he had Mellon indicted for tax evasion, and Mellon beat it. And they had one meeting face to face on December 31st, 1936, and it's the prologue of the novel. We know what happened at that meeting because there were witnesses and people there. It was when the National Gallery of Art was born. Mellon gave the $8 million to create the National Gallery of Art. And they had this really very confrontational meeting there that day. I changed it around a little bit. I figured if they really hate each other, I'm going to make them really hate each other. So I added another aspect to their feud. And I added something to it that creates the entire patriot threat. It also deals with a man named Hyman Solomon who's in the novel, which is pretty interesting. I knew nothing of this man when I started writing the book. But he's probably one of the most unsung founding fathers ever. He doesn't even have the title of a founding father, but he should. He's the man who financed the American Revolution. He found the money to keep the fight going, and he loaned the country $800,000 of his own money to, to keep the, the war going on. After the war, he died right before the right uh, right after the war. His um, heirs tried to get repayment on that debt, and he, they were refused. Congress five times has considered repayment, and five times said no. 
we probably owe his heir somewhere around $300 billion right now is what we owe them if you wanted to pay that debt back. But I never knew this about Solomon. It's a fascinating guy. He factors into the novel. He's here. I wanted you to learn some things about him. My antagonist is a North Korean. I was fascinated by North Korea. It's an amazing country, really interesting place. But I hear the baby. <laughs> Mama's going. My wife's looking after the baby. <laughs> we told her when we started that she's a little out of practice, so you can tell she's a little out, out of practice. The, uh, the antagonist uh, with, is, I don't know if you know this or not, but the guy who's running North Korea right now was not supposed to run North Korea. His older brother was supposed to have that job. His older brother, though, committed the unthinkable sin of getting caught trying to sneak into Japan to go to Disneyland with one of his children. He got caught. It just actually happened. And, there, and his father disowned him. He lost his entire birthright by trying to go to Disneyland. And that's how we got this little fellow who runs North Korea now. He, does, he was not supposed to be anywhere near in the, the realm of power. He just lucked into it. There's a middle brother, but he's incompetent. He just can't do anything. He's completely not able to lead. So this guy just got it by default. He was the only other male child left. I brought the brother back in the novel, so uh, I bring him back in a different form. I have some fun with him. He's back to claim his birthright. So all this plays out, as I said, over 23 hours through the National Gallery, through that painting that you heard mentioned uh, that's there in Gallery 62 that's pretty cool, and through the $1 bill that has some amazing stuff on the back of it that I think will surprise you. All of this is the Patriot threat. Um, that book has is, is been out now three weeks. It's done very well. I've been uh, number five, eight, and 11 now on the New York Times list. So we've had three weeks there, which is really nice. Uh, next year's book is done. You stay a year ahead in the book business. In fact, see this book, I turned it in um, a year ago and wrote it a year before that. So it's been two years since I've dealt with this book. I actually have to read the book before I go on tour because I've dealt with two other books in the meantime, so I've actually purged this book completely from my brain, and so I had to work on that. You were out of practice, weren't you? You were out of practice, weren't you? You got caught. So <laughs> she hasn't done that in a while. Oh. <laughs> so next year's book, as I said, is done and finished. It's called The 14th Colony. Here's a Jeopardy question. We had 13 colonies. There were supposed to be a 14th colony, what is blank? What is it? Nope. Canada. Canada was supposed to be the, it was. Canada at that time was the, uh, was the province of Quebec. It was supposed to come into the country. We wanted it so bad that we tried to get it at the peace talks in 1783. We couldn't get it. We invaded Canada twice. We got our tails kicked twice. It's the only country in the world that has defeated America on the battlefield two times. There's a third uh, chat time, though, that we made a play for Canada, which surprised me and shocked me. And you're going to be, I think, a little surprised by it yourself. It did me. It's something real from history. And Cotton Malone gets caught up in that in the 14th colony, something from the Cold War that's very interesting. Uh, and I'm working on the book after that now. It'll take me another year to write it, so I'll turn it in next year, which will be published in 2017. So that's what I came to tell you and talk to you about. Now let's ask questions. Let's see what you want to talk about. Fire away. Go ahead. So do you ever reread your book and say, I gotta put that in there? Well, I try not to. <laughs> you see, I've read the book 70 times. By the time I finished a novel, literally, I mean this, I have read the novel 70 times and with the editing and all the things that I go through over and over again. I've read it so much that I never ever want to read it again as long as I live. Every once in a while, like if I'm waiting somewhere, I'm somewhere and there's a stack of books there, I will pick one up and read a few pages. And I will say that I don't have that feeling as much because... You know, you might change a word or two, but I, would, I don't read it and go, God, that's just pathetically awful. And I think that's because I did read it 70 times, and I went through it so much. So, and I'm not saying that it's perfect or whatever. I'm just saying that I think I gave it my best shot when I could. And, and Now, if I could get my hands on the Amber Room again, I think I could get four or 5,000 words out of it. But that was my first novel, and I was learning things. I think I could polish that one down a little, little tighter. But a lot of people say that's their favorite book of mine. So uh, I, take, I love that, that people say that, that they think the first book is that way. And it's my special, too, because it's my firstborn. Uh, yes, ma'am. Tell us a little bit more about your background, because I, I'm in a book club, as many of us are, and we always want to know a little bit more about the novelist behind the book. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to ask you to tell us a little bit about your background, and then we'll get into the book. 
author and why they did what they did or wrote what they wrote? Well, I didn't write my first words. I was 35 years old. So those of you who are writers out there and younger than that, please keep going. Don't waste time. I wasted a lot of time. I started writing in the summer of 1990 because of the little voice in my head. People say, why do you write? A writer's answer to that is very simple. You write because you have to. You have to because you have a little voice in your head that drives you crazy. If you write, the voice will hush. If you don't, it nags at you. Those of you who are writers out there know exactly what I'm talking about. Every writer I've ever met in the world tells me the exact same thing, that they have a little voice in their head. I had that voice for 10 years and I ignored it. I did, I just completely ignored it. Finally, in the summer of 1990, I listened to it, I started writing, when I got done, I had a manuscript that was about that tall, it's 170,000 words long, which tells you how bad it was, by the way. It was awful, it's, it's like unintelligible, you know, you, do, you wouldn't even want to read it at all. But it's the greatest thing I will ever write in my life. And I keep it. It's the only manuscript I've ever kept. It sits on my desk a few feet away from me. I see it every day. And the reason why I keep it is, is because I started it and I finished it. 90% of all writers do not finish what they start. We teach writing as part of our History Matters Foundation. We've taught around 2,800 students, so we, we know this malady. It's a clear malady that writers have, that they, they quit, and we try to get them not to quit. Well, I was a lawyer. I practiced law. I was a trial lawyer. I did divorces. I did like 10,000 divorces. I did criminal defense. I, I did anything in the courtroom, but I was also a street lawyer. I was in a small town, so anything that came in off the street, we handled it. And I did an awful lot of a little of little things constantly. And I practiced law for 30 years, and I did now, but from the day I wrote my first word to the day I sold my first word was 12 years. I wrote eight manuscripts, five went to New York houses, rejected 85 times. I made it on the 86th time on a, on a resubmit of the Amber Room. And then the Amber Room was published in 03, and I've been fortunate that the books have been building on each other ever since then. They built to the point that in 2008, I had to make a choice, either practice law or write. I couldn't, there was no time, there was literally no time to do both anymore. And so we shut the law practice down, and now I write full time and do it. But it didn't start off to be that way, it just worked that way, and it's really great that I was able to become a commercial fiction writer. So that's kind of my, my sad tale, but it, but it turned out good. <laughs> it was tough for a while, yes. Uh, a lot of your not your Cotton Malone novels are very visual because there's there's a lot of travel involved. When you're researching your works, do you, how do you remember all the detail? Do you take pictures? Do you talk into your iPhone or what do you do? We, we have a, we have a lot of high tech in our place. We write it down. <laughs> Right. Uh, uh, I rarely talk into it. First off, you look kind of silly walking around in Europe, you know, talking into this thing the whole time. And so I don't really do it. What I do is I'll, uh, I'll take a little notepad with me and I'll just jot down notes in there uh, during the day. When we go on a research trip, our research trips, and that sounds like, you know, like, ooh, you get to do research trip. It's, they're horrible. You don't, you don't want to go. Uh, uh, anybody who goes on a research trip with us would be bored to tears because, you know, you're up at 7 in the morning, you're on the ground by 7.30 or 8, you go till 8 or 9 at night. We have a set and schedule we're looking for. We're looking for certain stuff. We're on a treasure hunt because if I knew what it was, I wouldn't have to go find it. You understand? I only went there because I can't find it anywhere else. I can't find it in the books. I can't find it anywhere. I have to go physically and look for it. An example would be in the, the Charlemagne pursuit. When we went to the cathedral at Aachen, and there's very little to do in Aachen, in Aachen, Germany, in the middle of winter. It's freezing. It's 20 degrees. There's not much there. But the cathedral is magnificent. They don't heat it. It's cold. So we sat in that cathedral for four days. And everything Cotton Malone discovered in that cathedral, I discovered in that cathedral during that four days. And that plot was developed while I was there. We keep our research trips to four days. We keep them tight, and we, we go looking. Now, a lot of times when we get there, if we're not, if the research beforehand that I plan doesn't work, we head off on tangents. And those are really scary, because now we have no idea what we're looking for, you know? Because we, at least before I did the research, and I was paying attention to it. The Venetian portrayal is a good example. I had read about, you know, the island of Torcello. And I said, that looks like a really cool place. Everything I looked at, we got on the boat, we went over there, I got off, I said, 
said, this is it, found it. You know, we were there. So we spent a day there, and all that happens on Torcello was discovered while we were there. So the trips are targeted, and they're set up to get the information we need because I'm, use, I'm, I'm, I'm expending time and money and energy going on the trip. But there's always one book. There's usually one where I run out. This book had Venice and Croatia and D.C. Uh, in it. We were on the cruise that Malone takes in the novel. And so I used it in the book. It wasn't supposed to be. It was supposed to be a vacation, but it didn't work out that way. And I think I've worked it in there. But Croatia was really cool, so I used it in Venice. And all those things that happened in Venice, I was able to see myself. Other questions? Yes? What inspired you to take actual historical fact and meld it with your fictional writing? I like... I like that kind of story. I like action, history, secrets, conspiracy, international settings. I, I, you know, the, to me, the grandmother of this is Helen McGinnis. You know, she wrote those books back in the 40s and 50s and 60s, and she did this. Uh, Ludlum, of course, did, did it. David Morrell, the great thriller writer, did it. There's a lot of folks who did it. Catherine Neville may have done it the closest the first time because she actually has that. She has a little element of mysticism in hers, a little bit there. Um, and, of course, you know, Dan Brown himself did it in the early books. I was a fan of Dan Brown long before Da Vinci Code, and he was writing these kinds. So I love these kinds of novels. And I think I've taken it one step a little further, though, because I try to keep the books about 90% accurate, as close, to, as close as I can keep it. Now, I've got to trip it up a little bit because it's a novel. I'm here to entertain you. I've got to do it. But I put that writer's note in the back that tells you that. And I'm about one of the only ones that puts an extensive writer's note in the back of their novel that tells you exactly what's real and exactly what's not. So when you leave that book, you don't think it. But what you're going to find, though, is you're going to think something's false. You're going to find out that it's true because I keep it as close to reality as I can. And that's why it takes 18 months to produce one of these books, because I have to keep it as close. It'd be so much easier if I could make it all up. I mean, you know, so, so much faster. But I have to take the real thing and mix it all in here. And this book was, uh, was, was that way. There was a lot of elements that had to come together here. Yes, sir. I read somewhere, and I think this was dealing with your 24-hour period of the book, that did you start at the conclusion and work where you... Well, kind of like that. But you get asked a question all the time. You say, where do you start a novel? Now, there's a simple answer to that question. You start a novel as close to the end as possible. Now, that presupposes what? you got to know the end, right? So you, know, you don't have to know every detail of it, but you got to know generally what's the end of this book. And then you get as close to it as you can get. Most times for me it's two days because of just the way the time and way all the things have to play out. I need two days, but this one I was able to do in 23 hours. And uh, Charlemagne's my biggest book. It went on for 14 days, so it was the longest book. But there's a lot going on, a lot of travel in that book. They're moving a lot of places, so I needed days to travel. So, you know, you, you find the end, and you come back as close as you can get to it. I do events all the time. I do uh, panels, and I have writers there. And there are writers sometimes, they want to make this sound a little more mystical than it really is. And uh, I'm, I'm there, and they'll ask this question about, you know, well, how do you, how do you know where to start? How do you know where the book's going? How do you know what's going on? They would say, well, I don't really. I come in each day, and I sit down in front of the machine, and my fingers go up there. And, and, or better yet, most of these guys always handwrite their novels, by the way, which to me is amazing that you handwrite. Because you've got to input it on a typewriter at some point, okay? So you got to, so they always handwrite their books and and I just let my fingers take me where I want to go and I really don't know where the story's going I figured out and I want to raise my hand so bad and Elizabeth out there won't let me I want to raise my hand so bad and say are you crazy <laughs> I've been doing this 25 years never one day have I ever sat down and magically everything just blew out of my brain uh, you know, what now it does blow out of your brain if you thought about it for two weeks and you've worked on it, and you've plotted it, and you've done your research, and you put it together, yeah, it'll come out of your brain and that way, but not just flowing out. So in my case, when I start a book, yes, I know the ending of the book. I have to know that. Otherwise, I'd just be scattered all over where I, where, you just imagine, you know, if you started a project, you didn't know what the end result was going to be. You're just going to keep going, and we'll figure it out as we go. You're going to waste a lot of time. A lot of times. So I always have that end, and then I get as close to it as I can. This time was great because I could get it in 24 hours. 
Other questions? Yes, ma'am. What tips do you have for beginner writers? What tips do I have for beginning writers? I have the most important piece of tip you will ever get in your life. You have to write every day. You have to write. Writing is a discipline. It is not an obsession, though. You do not get obsessed by it. But it is a discipline, and you have to set a discipline that works for you. Now, for your age, I mean, you don't initially have to write every day, but I think you ought to write, you know, a few times a week, you know, be great, you know, is what you want. You want to set up something that, a discipline. In my case, I had to churn out a thousand words a day. That was my goal. If I could do a thousand words a day, I could produce a novel in 12 months. Because I knew if I ever got to do this, they would want a novel every 12 months. So I had to teach myself how to write a book in a 12 month period. So I would go to the law office every day at 6.30 and I would work from 6.30 to 9 and then I'd do the work for after that. But I do my two and a half hours and get my thousand words in. The reason why I could do a thousand words because I thought about what I was going to write long before I got there and I was ready to go. In your case, the best thing is to write as much as you can, to study your genre, the genre that you really you're passionate about and study it and learn it as much as you can and just read and write, read and write. That's what it is. There's only one way to learn how to write. Only one. There's no other way to learn how. You know what it is? You have to write. Because there's no one in the world that can teach anyone how to write. It's impossible. There's no such thing as a writing teacher. But there are teachers that can teach you how to teach you how to write. Yes, there are. There are people that can teach you how to teach yourself, and I found some of those. And I learned how to teach myself the craft of writing. I would stress that you need to find the same thing, people that can help teach you how to teach yourself the craft. And over time, it's a progressive thing. The cool thing about writing is anybody can acquire the skill. Anybody. doesn't matter. Anybody can acquire it if you want to. There's no magical to it. The only magic is if you want to acquire it, you can, you can do it. Other question? Yes. What was your favorite novel as an early child? As an early child, mine were Hardy Boys, because that's all there were back then. I mean, there was no, there was no young adult. You know, it was Hardy Boys or Nancy Drew or Tom Swift or, you know. But I loved Hardy Boys. I mean, they were. I read every one of them. I mean, The Twisted Claw, which is the number, the 18, number 18. That's the. I know. I remember it very well. Yeah. Well, the reason I remember, it, I have a copy of it, sits right next to me, just I see it all the time. But I remember reading The Twisted Claw in 1965, and that's the seed of what I'm, why I'm here today. That book had a museums and old manuscripts and secrets and a secret society and an international setting on an island and pirates in it. It had everything I have in my books, action, history, secrets, conspiracies, international settings. They were all in The Twisted Claw, and that's where, that's where it started for me. And then the very first adult fiction book I ever read was at age six, 15 or 16. I read Hawaii by Michener, and Michener remains my favorite writer of all time. But Hawaii was just like, wow, that's incredible, incredible. I couldn't believe somebody could create something like that. So I kind of got that dose of history early, and that's probably where all this came from. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. After 85 rejections, who acquired your novel? After 85 rejections, how did I get here? Well, what happened for me is I caught a break. And that's what happens. You, um, you know, the harder you practice, the luckier you get. You know, that's, that's how it sounds. That's how it worked for me. The, I caught a break. The world changed. I didn't really change. The world changed. I write, what I write used to be called a spy thriller. And in 1990, when the Soviet Union, 1991, when the Soviet Union fell and the Berlin Wall came down, the Cold War ended, the spy novel died. Now, if you were Ludlum or La Carre or Cussler, you're fine. But if you were trying to break in, forget it. By the mid-'90s, the genre was gone. By 2000, it was dead, buried, and forgotten. It had just died off to nothing. And then in 2002, Random House bought a book from an unknown writer, a guy whose first three books were a total failure. But the fourth book was different. It was kind of fresh. It was unique. It was something they had not seen in a long, long time. And it was The Da Vinci Code. And it came back as action, history, secrets, conspiracies, international settings. Guess what I was writing? You know? And so Mark Tavani at Ballantine Books, we resubmitted The Amber Room, was looking for stuff to go with Da Vinci. Now, this is a year before Da Vinci was published now. Now, they, did, they knew they had something there, but they didn't know they had one of the largest selling fiction books of all time. But they knew they had something. 
and they bought the Amber Room to go with it. We sent it to Dan to give me a blurb, and he did, and he said, my kind of thriller, and we've used those words all over the world. God bless his soul. And it, so I would not be here but for Da Vinci Code. Da Vinci brought the genre back to life. And I, I believe I'm not the only one, by the way. There's a lot of writers that got a start thanks to Da Vinci. And that is why to this day, when I go into a bookstore and I walk by a Da Vinci, I stop and I bow. <laughs> she will not do it. She refuses. She defiles the Da Vinci. And it's sacrilegious what she does to Da Vinci. Thank goodness there's not as many in the stores as there used to be because you did a lot of bowing in those days. But uh, I owe him a lot. I owe him a, everything. I mean, that, that Doubleday took a chance on the book, and Dan wrote the book, and it changed everything. And uh, the International Thriller Writers, which is a group of thriller writers from 2,800 thriller writers from around the world, that organization was created because of Da Vinci, because we were able to, the thriller, the thriller genre came back to life, and it's been, it's been doing great ever since. Yes, ma'am. Silly question. How did you come up with Cotton Malone's name? Silly question. There's no silly questions. That's, that's a good question, actually. How did I come up with Cotton Malone's name? I originally called him something else. I did. And I took it to the writer's group. I learned, to, I learned my craft in a writer's group where you took your chapter each week, you read it out loud, and everybody destroys it, basically, is what they do. It's in a critical process. And the, one of the ladies in the group said, that's the stupidest name I've ever heard in my life. And I said, well, what do you want to call him? She said, well, let's call him Cotton. I said, I like that. So she actually named him. She named him. Her name's Deva. And she's thanked in the Templar legacy. Now, that's how he got his name for me. Now, how did Cotton get his name in Cotton's world? Those of you who read the books know every time he gets asked, he says, long story, long story. Well, it actually is a long story. It's an entire book long story, and you'll get that story in 2017, <laughs> if you will. I, right now, tentatively, I'm, I'm going to tell that story. I'm, I might change my mind, but it's working on it. There's a, it's an interesting thing. It goes back to the Civil War. And it's, uh, it's going to be something interesting that Cotton gets caught up in. It's going to deal with very, something cool with the Smithsonian. I serve on the Smithsonian Libraries Board. We, uh, we administer and raise money for the 22 Smithsonian Libraries. And we, uh, it's a big job. So I, those of you who deal that for this library, I understand your pain, and I know what you go through. It's tough. So uh, I've been wanting to do something incorporating the Smithsonian. Yes. What was his name before? Oh, it's that bad, I have to tell you. We, I actually gave him the nickname of Pepper. And the reason why is we had a bailiff at the courthouse. That was his nickname. And so we called him Pepper all the time. And I'd called him Pepper for like 10, 12 years. And I thought it was a cool name. You know, I said, I'll call him Pepper, you know. And she said, that's stupid. You know, she says, that's dumb. And when she said Cotton, I went, no, I like that much better too. Let's go with that. So I immediately went with it. But uh, Pepper was his original uh, nickname that he had. Other question? Yes. Yeah. Um when you're looking at planning your book, and you're on 2017 now, and when you're looking at 2018, 2019, how many ideas are you are percolating in your brain? And how do you choose? There's always three in my brain. If you're going to, because of the nature of my books. Now, that's not true of most writers. Most writers can formulate and write their books in about a nine-month period. Mine, because of that research and because of the fact that I keep it 90% to reality, I have to find all that stuff, it takes time. So what I have to do to stay on schedule is while I'm writing the book I'm writing, I have to be researching and outlining the next novel so that when I'm done writing, I can start the next one immediately. So what happens right now, I'm writing 17, I'm researching and, and outlining 18, and I'm conceptualizing 19. So there's three in my brain. What will happen later this year, I'll finish up 17, I'll be writing 18, outlining and researching 19, conceptualizing 20. You can see how it works. You just stay ahead of myself. So I'm, I have to find stuff that you're going to find interesting two years from now. You know, what are you going to like two years from now? What are you, and that's, that's, that's a little tricky, but we've been pretty good at predicting it so far because I try to find fresh stuff, stuff that no one's ever touched before. I don't want to do what someone's done. I mean, come on, who's ever done a thriller on the 16th Amendment, you know? Nobody. I mean, you know, you know it, it's good. It works. It's something different. I don't have to worry about anybody stealing it is what I'm saying. So I look for those ideas, and luckily I'm okay for the next four years in ideas. You had a question, ma'am? Yes, what age groups are you really, you know, shooting for? Oh, I, my books can be read by anybody 12 and up. I mean, I have, 
I have some young adult readers. Uh, now they need to be they need to be uh, fairly sophisticated young adult readers that read at adult at a at a you know ninth, eighth, ninth, tenth grade level, and because they are a little more than YA. They don't have their little the sentence structure and all is a little more than YA, but they're not sophisticated. My average sentence length is only like ten words. I keep my sentences short. You know, I don't like them. I don't like long sentences. But we have a we have audience. I, I have a twelve year old that reads every one of them, and uh, they don't have problems. My books don't have any sex or bad words in them, other than the Amber Room. The Amber Room is the only book that has a lot of bad words in it and sex. I figured out that I didn't need the bad words. I could do it without it. And then I figured out that I write sex horribly, so I'm not going to write it anymore. It's very hard to write, so I don't like it to write it, and so I take it out. And I and it gets in the way of the stories anyway. They don't. So the books have, are pretty set where folks can read those. I think you'd be fine with them. You ought to check some of them out. Yes, ma'am. Um, you were talking about how organized you are with everything that you're doing with the books. What about? The promotion of the book that you wrote two years ago. I mean, how does that all fit in? Well, what? if it's in there, we have to get geared up for this. Like, this is a four-week period for us. We've been on the road three weeks. We go back home on the weekend, but then I do local stuff all next week. I do media all during this. I've probably done 75, 80 radio interviews. I've probably done 15 or 20 television interviews. There's You, you have that. It's called the business of writing, and in today's world, you can't just be a writer. You have to be in the business of writing, too, and so that's all factored in, and I spend maybe two hours a day dealing with the business of writing every day. I have a publicist, a full-time publicist. I have uh, I have a, the foundation. I have three people who work for me. It's a it's a business. It's literally a business, and so I have to deal with all of that. And it's part of it in today's world. If you're going to uh, if you're going to try to have a wide worldwide audience, we're in fifty you know fifty uh, countries around the world. So we have a lot that we have to deal with. So yeah, it's it's a business, and that's why I had to quit practicing law. It was it, I just couldn't do both anymore. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Hey, no problem. You do, we appreciate the autographing of the books. I have two questions. One, do you have a prized autograph book of yours? And what is the most unusual autograph you've been ever asked to write? <laughs> well, I refuse most of the unusual ones because they will get me in big trouble. Um, what my Best autograph book is probably the Michener book, the one book that I have autographed by him, which I never met him. He died before I was published. I would love to have met him, but I did buy an autograph book. Michener used to say that he signed so many books that the valuable ones are the ones he did not sign. <laughs> yeah, that's, he was very generous with his autographing, and I do have one uh, signed by him, and that is kind of precious to me. They just re-released all of Michener's books in trade paperback, by the way. There's a whole new series, a whole new set of them, and I got to write the introduction, which was really cool yeah random house asked me to write it so i got to i got to write that and, and it was really neat because he is my favorite of all i probably i don't know if i have any un, un, unusual thing because i do actually do refuse to write some things because they'll want me to write things about you know best night i ever had you know best thing and i can just see that on the internet now you know so i don't do it i i don't do those um i get asked probably the most unusual is they want me to write a quote from the book and I, and I have to be careful about that because I have to think about that when they want me to do that, or to write a specific quote out of the novel. Uh, most of it, they keep it pretty simple. Yes, ma'am. Um, I wonder, do you have uh, music, uh, musicians in your book? Well, I don't have them in the book, but I had to have music that I listen to when I write. And I want to do a thriller with music, by the way. I just haven't found it yet because music is like the universal language. I don't care where you are, what it is. It's the same language for everybody. And it would be really cool to, to do something with that. I just haven't figured out what that novel would be yet. It would be kind of cool to hide a message in music. Uh, and, I, and I'd like to learn more about music. To me, people who write music are like, wow, that's fascinating. I, mean, I guess they look at me, people who write novels, as fascinating. But those who write music, I said, how do those little notes tell you exactly what to do? It's quite remarkable. But I, I, I do listen to music when I write. Yes, I do. And I try to have the music of what I'm writing about. Like if it's like in this case, I had Venetian music. I had, I had some Croatian music, that kind of thing. I bought it while I was over there. So I try to listen to the music of where, where I'm writing, and that kind of keeps me in the mood. Yes, sir. Bouncing off his question from earlier with your outline of conceptualization. Do you try to fit the location and the history to your idea or try to fit the idea to a location? Well, it depends on 
usually it's the idea to the location because the idea is the cool thing and I can't get rid of that. That's the most important thing of the book is what I call the ooh thing. If I say it, you kind of go ooh, like when, it, when they said federal income tax, you know, you were like, ooh, Templars will do that, Charlemagne, Paris, uh, you know, the Library of Alexandria, things that kind of get you go like, ooh, that's pretty cool, I want to know more. That's the ooh thing. Once I get that, then I need the so what. Who cares about the 16th Amendment, whether it was illegally ratified? Why does it matter? Well, it matters a great deal if, you, if certain things happen. So I have to have that so what. It still needs to matter today. So those two things I have to find first, and they're the hardest. Then I fit them into locations. Sometimes the locations don't work. I have to, you know, I have to work around it. In this case, I was fortunate that when we were on that cruise, I began to see that it would work, and I could make it all work. So I started the book actually on the cruise and had it work off the cruise that we were taking there and played off. And then Croatia is an amazing place. I thought it was really cool. So I worked it into the book. Another question. Yes, ma'am. Do you use the same methods each time you write another book? Yes. Use the same. Well, I use the same craft, yes, but I try to get better at it. That's the whole point. You want to get better at it with each book. You want each book to be smoother and tighter and cleaner. I try to do something new and different in every novel. Something I, well, like in this book, 24 hours. I want to plot this book in 24 hours. Never been able to do that before. Made it happen. Got it done. So it was something I'd never done before. Uh, sometimes I, I actually changed the way I plotted this book a little bit. Uh, no, I'm sorry, the next book. I experimented with it here, but the next book I, I changed the way I'm plotting a little bit to make it a little bit cleaner and easier to follow. I try to find something new that I've never done before, and I challenge you to do that too. Every time you write something, try to do something you've never done before each time. It also, not only is it better for your craft, it actually keeps your attention because you're not doing the same thing over and over again. Yes, ma'am. Um, since you have been a very prolific writer and obviously uh, have lots of fascinating subject matter, how does the editing process factor in with your publisher to what you're creating? Well, I, I rely on that a lot. Uh, I grew up, I was taught I taught myself the craft in a critical process, so criticism doesn't bother me. In fact, I like criticism. If you, if you write something back and said it's perfect, I get really like nervous. I don't like that. I mean, I, never, I was never told anything was perfect, ever. So I don't mind it. And so my editor goes through the book about three or four times. My agent goes through it about three or four times. I go through it 70 times. Uh, we have a copy editor, and the same copy editor has done all of my manuscripts, so she's very familiar with me, and, it's, and she's really good. But she's not catching a whole lot, because by the time we give it to her, we've got 99% of it. She's just catching a few little polish, which is really nice. Writers out there, you cannot rely on someone else to be your editor. You have to learn the art of self-editing. You have to teach yourself how to self-edit, and you have to be the hardest person on yourself than anybody else would ever be. I'm harder on me than anybody would be. So by the time we get my, when I get my copy edits back, I can go through her changes in an afternoon. I know writers, it takes two weeks for them to go through those changes because they've not gone through the book 70 times, see. She's making all of those changes that should have been made long ago. But I do so many rereads. Now, we do have one other eye on this. When I'm done, editor's done, agent's done, we're kind of done. You know, we've read it so much, we're not really much help anymore. It's, things will slip right by us. So we have a fresh eye, and that's Elizabeth. Elizabeth is the fresh eye. She's out there somewhere. And she gets the book. Now, Elizabeth knows nothing about the books. I don't tell her anything about the plots of the novels. She only knew that this book was about the 16th Amendment. That's it. She didn't know characters. She didn't know plot. She didn't know locations. She didn't know nothing. We do that on purpose. She is kept completely out of the loop. She gets the manuscript, the last eye after we're all done. When she reads it, so she's a fresh eye, and she's got a really good eye. She has a, a company called Thousand One Dark Nights that deals in the romance business. She does a lot of editing. There. She's really good at this. And so she reads the book. And if she finds something, now I'm not talking about a typo or something. I'm talking about a plot flaw, big plot flaw that we forgot to fix or we left open, just something really embarrassing that we go like, wow, you know, the guy's alive here, he's dead there, he's alive again, you know, we forgot to take him out, you know, we missed. Uh, if she finds that, she gets purses and shoes. 
Now, she does not get purses and shoes from Target, which is a great place, by the way. I like that place a lot. She likes uh, that uh, Louis Vuitton guy, you know that guy, and that channel store. She, I think she actually visited one of those stores today that you have here. Uh, they pray to people, you know, those guys. It has to be that level of shoes and purses, otherwise there would be no incentive on me to be careful. And, uh, and, and that's the deal, if you find it. So she tries really hard because she's got an incentive to find this now. Uh, last four books, she ain't got nothing, <laughs> zero. But four books ago, she got a purse. Yeah, I made, made a mistake, and she caught it. Yes? The light, I hate to dim the light and mood, but Harper Lee has been a big part of all of our reading mm -hmm. interests lately. Sure. I'm just sort of interested in your thoughts about what's happening there. Well, I mean... I don't. I mean, I don't know factually what's going on there. I mean, I'm assuming you know they've, they, you know, the, everyone's taken a look at that, and you know, she's willingly wants to publish this this book that she wrote beforehand. We don't know the answer to that question. We only know that the state of Alabama looked at it and said it's okay, and we don't have any indication that there's anything wrong with it. Um, I don't. I don't know enough about it to comment on it. Uh, it'll be fascinating to see the book, though, because to me, To Kill a Mockingbird may be the great American novel. It may be the finest American novel ever written. It's a magnificent story. So it'll be interesting to see that story as an adult. She's an adult looking back, which was actually written before the book, according to the way the legend is. Uh, so I don't know enough about it to comment on what's happening with it. I know that the authorities have looked at it, and I'm assuming unless they're all in on a giant conspiracy, there must be something here that's okay, because there's so many people that have taken a look at this thing now. Uh, certainly it's a book that's going to make a gazillion dollars. You realize, uh, you realize that uh, To Kill a Mockingbird still sells like a half a million copies every year. It, it beats me on the list every year. Every year on the USA Today list, To Kill a Mockingbird is ahead of me. Uh, that book is 60 years old and still sells that much. It's a phenomenal book. So this one's going to really, it's going to go through the ceiling. Yes. I was always interested in the choice of Copenhagen, I guess, as the starting point. Was that the original choice? Yes. Uh, no, not originally. The original uh, Templar legacy, Cotton Malone was, of course, called Pepper, you know, which is an awful name, by the way. So he's got Pepper. So he's got, he, had, he was called that, and he was a totally different guy. I was in Copenhagen. I was sitting in Hybro Plods at the Cafe Nordon. I was sitting there one evening, and Cotton came to my brain. I said, he's going to live here. He's going to be a retired Justice Department. He's going to have the bookshop right over there. Everything came. I wrote it all down on a napkin, um, went back, threw those 30,000 words away that I had started, and rewrote really the book, started over again, and Cotton became who you see today. I thought I lost the napkin. I thought I threw it in the garbage. I found it a few months ago. So I actually still have the napkin where Cotton was first born. So I'm going to frame it and put it up on the wall. But it, it did come because I was there. And it's just a magical place. I love Copenhagen. Yes, sir? So are you writing a standalone? No. Uh, the next book's Cotton. Cotton will be around for a few years. I, last, I've done four standalones, Amber Room, Romanoff Prophecy, Third Secret, Columbus Affair. And I like them, but people like cotton, and I can only do one a year, so my brain can only take it. Uh, I'd love to revisit what happened to Miles Lord and what happened to Tom Sagan and all those guys. I thought it was really, really cool. So um, uh, one day maybe, but right now for the next four or five books, it'll be a cotton, cotton story, yes. Yes, ma'am? We have a musical background. Back to her question. We heard all the original Three Dog Night music before they ever performed in public. Heard all their originals before they even recorded them. Do you, where would you write an author? If you have an idea, say, about either a children's book, where do you write? Do you write the publisher? Do you write the author? No, I mean, you mean to have someone write the book? Oh, if you have an idea or you have a suggestion or you just want to write that author and congratulate them. Oh, no. Well, you go to find their websites. 99% of us have. I have one, steveberry.org. Most writers have a website, and they have a contact form. Rarely, if they don't have that, you can, you can get in touch with their publisher, get to their publicist. Because I get a little envelope every once in a while from the publisher, and they have little notes in there that are sent directly to the publisher, and they send them to me. They contacted me. They wanted, I have a video and pictures of the Three Dog Nights before. And they contacted me. I thought it was somebody in our band was joking with me. So I hung up the phone. Well, well, they may find you again. Well, yeah, I, I think I'm now I'm talking. I figured out how to do it. But I'm just thinking the musician ideas. 
Yeah, you just have to hunt it down. You got to do a little detective work, is what. But most most writers, most places have uh, have websites now, which are a godsend because you can communicate. I read every email that comes to that website. I don't answer them. I have uh, uh, Jessica answers them for me, but I read them all. Yeah. Other questions? We got time for a couple more. Yeah, um, I was fortunate enough to start with the Tim Hart legacy, and then I went back and read Roman off in the third secret and Amber. And the Amber Room really got my attention because I'd never heard of it. And it's such a spectacular It thing. is. I saw it. <laughs> I was wondering, when you do research, or, or are you still interested in that stuff and look and see if maybe they can find <coughs> where that went? Well, the problem with the Amber Room is... Uh, it's most likely destroyed. Uh, a couple of reporters for the London Times did some research on this a few years ago, and they wrote a book called The Amber Room, a nonfiction book. Uh, and they, their theory, I think, is correct. Uh, the, the Russians burned it by accident when they torched Konigsberg Castle. It, the Amber Room was crated up. It was 100 tons of, it was 10 tons of amber. It was crated up. It was supposed to be shipped out. It never made it out. They set fire to the castle because they were so mad at the Germans. The fire was 1,000 degrees because it melted stone. Amber goes from solid to gas at 200 degrees. It's gone. The reason why we suspect that's what happened is there was a lot of witnesses that day that reported that the town smelled of incense for a couple of days, and amber, when it burns, smells of incense. And imagine 10 tons of amber burning, and, uh, and it went up. And, and they did some research on this, and they're pretty certain that's what happened to it. In the novel, I give it a little more glorious ending than that, though. I, I changed it. I didn't like that ending a little bit, but I did. Uh, most likely, the amber room's gone. 10 tons of amber does not just disappear. It's going to turn up somewhere, and there's not been one trace of that anywhere. Yes, ma'am? There is. It's been recreated. They recreated it exactly from photographs. I was there in 1985. So none of that, was that is not original amber. No, that is. But it is the original design. It's quite remarkable how they did it. They had 32 black and white pictures of the original room. They told us. That yeah. I went into the, well, I got into the workshop. I spent, I spent an afternoon in the workshop. And they took the pictures and they blew them up to the size of the panels, which are like 12 foot by 4 foot. And then they would make each piece of amber to fit. It's like making a jigsaw puzzle in reverse. And they made each piece to fit. And it's jewel grade amber. And that's how they did it. They, they recreated the room. It's now finished. I was there in 2009 again and saw it finished. If you ever get a chance, it's worth it. It's the most ma magnificent thing you've ever laid your eyes on. But I watched them make it in 1995, and it was uh, quite remarkable uh, then. Back then, you could hang out there for days. There was no one there because now when you go to the palace, the room is crowded. They won't even let you stop. I spent three days in the room with nobody there. There was just no one around. Now, they, they, there's a, you know, the babushkas are there, and they, shh, they make you go. So what I did, if you, if you go, there's a little trick. It makes a circle around. You go out this room and come around. So I just go out and keep coming back around. I just go out and come back around. I just keep coming back around. I went back around like 10 times, all the way back around. And, uh, and they won't let you take pictures in there anymore either. But it is an incredible sight if you ever get to see it. Uh, let me do it. Yes. But you said that you were, uh, you had 85 rejections. On those, were these a handful of books that were just revised and sent out and then rejected? Revised? No, no. These were full-length manuscripts written from scratch. I, I wrote... Uh, I mean, that's a joke. <laughs> no, no. I'm quite serious. I wrote, uh, I wrote The Amber Room in 1995. It went to 18... Back then, there were 18 publishers. Today, there's six. So that tells you the difference of what's changed in consolidation. 18 publishers, they went out. They all rejected it. I wrote The Romanoff Prophecy. It went out. 18 publishers said no. Third Secret went out. No. Then I wrote... Th then I wrote... Uh, two more manuscripts, uh, well, well, no, I'm sorry, five more manuscripts. You know, there were more manuscripts, each one written. It, five made it to New York. Three of them never made it to New York, but five made it to New York, rejected too. They all went in the drawer. They went back in the drawer. They, they sat in the drawer. The Amber Room sat in a drawer for seven years, from 1992 to 2002. And I pulled it out one day, and I reread it, and I said, you know, this is a really good story. I only did a little light edit on it and did some changes for what I'd learned during those seven years. And I convinced my agent to resubmit it. And that's a no-no in the business. You don't really get to resubmit things twice. But if seven years had gone by, no one's going to remember that, you know. And they didn't remember it, by the way, because, you know, Ballantyne had rejected it seven years earlier. But remember, it's the wrong time. Remember? Wrong timing was wrong. Time was wrong. And when it went back, I, on the 86th time, I was in the right place, right time, right story. On the 86th time. 
So I'm, I'm living proof that it can be done. <laughs> You know, it can be done. And I tell people all the time, don't, don't tell me you can't do it. I did it. You can do it. One more, a couple more questions. Yes, sir. Two of my favorite characters are Commonwealth Lieutenant Colonel John Smith from the Cold War series. Hmm? Lieutenant Colonel John Smith from the Cold War series. Um, they would never be, uh, I don't think they would be able to work in the same book. Would you ever write about an author? Well, it would be kind of cool if we could bring them together, but the, the Ludlum Estate would have to agree to, to, to do that. We actually did this in Face Off. I don't know if you've seen that. Uh, the book is called Face Off. We published it last year. The international thriller writers did. We took iconic characters and matched them together. My character was matched up with uh, Gray Pierce, you know, from James Rollins' series. Uh, and like uh, Michael Conley and Dennis Lehane's characters were matched together. John Sanford and, G and uh, Jeffrey Deaver were together. There's a whole bunch of them. The only reason we could pull that off is all the money from the book went to ITW. See, otherwise we couldn't do it because my publisher would want to publish it, Jim's publisher would want to publish it, and who gets the money? But here, ITW got all the money. We donated our stories. It's the only way it would ever work. And who knows? That would be kind of uh, cool, really, because we could get uh, somebody who writes that series today. Uh, we're looking at doing another face-off in a couple of years. That, never thought about pairing those two together. That would be kind of interesting. Be, be an interesting way. Well, Ludlum, I have a complete Ludlum collection at home. He's one of my, one of my favorites. Uh, these are written by co-writers, friends of ours that we know that are in ITW. I think we have time for one more question. One more? Well, go. Do, own do I own cats or dogs? I do not. I do not own any cats and dogs. Uh, I worked in a pet store for four years, and I got my fill of cats and dogs. I got my fill of fish. Have you ever cleaned a boa constrictor's mouth out? I, did, I have, many times. Uh, I got my fill of all, I love animals, they're great. I want you to enjoy them and have them. I defend your right to have them. But uh, I just, after four or five years of, uh, of dealing with them every day, that was, my, that was my job in high school and early college. I was worked in a pet store. Uh, and so uh, I, I didn't, um, I just... Yeah, I just I've been I've been snapped at and bitten at so many times, and I, I love them to death. But uh, uh, no, we don't really have any. Well, that's kind of a funny question to end on. That is, and it's the first time I've ever been asked that question, which is really cool. But thank, thank you so much for, for being thank here. Thank you, thank you.